Hello and welcome to my part 3 Raycaster trilogy, and I didn't think we'd make it this far. But then I saw your comments. I didn't think there'd be this much of a demand for a programming tutorial. And hey, if this is your first time here and you are super confused what you just clicked on, no worries. To catch you up to speed, I've got three videos, one to install OpenGL and see to get started, and then the first two tutorials in this trilogy. And at the end of this video, you'll end up with this program. I tried to put as much detail as I could in this video, and I'll walk you through all of it and show you how it works. And if you know how it works, you can modify it to make your own ideas. And all of this really doesn't take up much code at all. That's what's so powerful about a Raycaster. And to refresh your memory, a Raycaster is actually just a top-down two-dimensional game. But we can cast lines out through the player's view by checking horizontal and vertical collisions until we hit a wall. And then we compare which of those two hit first, and we can convert that into a vertical line strip. If you do that enough times, you can actually see the world you're in, and even apply textures to the walls. You can take these techniques to create a really fun game. You guys also seem to love the water commercial I filmed with my friends. So here we are, we've got another sponsor, I hope you enjoy. Um, yeah, thank you, Air, for sponsoring this video. Promotional codes link below. Get your Air today. Let's start by downloading version 2 from my GitHub, and we'll use that as a starting point for this part 3's video. Do you guys remember when we were manually typing in values to make our own textures? So let's not do that anymore. I want to show you a way that I figured out how to take any texture, export it a certain file type that we can edit in Notepad, and then load into our game. That sounds complicated, uh, so let me show you. GIMP is a free program that we're going to use to export a special file type. And I prefer to use Notepad++ and Photoshop, but honestly, you can use a variation of any of these programs as long as it does the same thing. And you can create your own images, or find images that you're free to use, or if you want to follow along with me, I found the textures I'm going to use on this website, which are already at 32 by 32 pixels and they tile. And let's find a texture that we're going to test this method out with first. Okay, so this is what you need to do. Open the texture in GIMP. And then export that image as a .ppm. It will give you two options. We don't want raw. We want ASCII. ASCII is great because it's going to be actual numerical values that we can read and edit in a normal text editor. And what we're looking at is every pixel's RGB value in order. So we can convert this into an array by first adding a comma at the end of all these numbers. We're going to find the dollar sign, which is a new line. Make sure your settings are the same as mine. And replace with a comma. Perfect. And now we don't want the first four lines. We can name this array and make sure you add a closing bracket and new line at the end. So we have the RGB value of the first pixel, RGB value of the second pixel, and these numbers go from 0 to 255. So this is basically just an external array that we're going to include in our main file. And just for a quick test, let's make a double for loop that we can load in each pixel. So every pixel's red, green, and blue value is in a row, so if we times by 3, we can skip to each pixel and then add 0, 1, or 2 to read that red, green, and blue value. Let's make it large by having each pixel be the size of 8. And if we do that, we need to multiply or offset each pixel by 8. Compile and run, and we can see our image. So we know our red, green, and blue values work, and we can save out any texture we want. But how do we attach it to the walls? Let's copy this code before we remove it, and then move up to where we're drawing our actual walls, and then replace it here. 
and update the variable names, keeping the same way we're drawing the vertex. And this takes the map and multiplies it by 32 to get to the next texture, but we just want to load one texture, so we can comment this out. And it's important that these are integer values. And don't forget the shades, because it looks so much cooler. And just like that, we now have textures on our walls. But who just wants one texture? Let's grab several textures and make it into one long vertical image. I think a vertical strip is better than horizontal, but we can easily add an image to the bottom without updating any code. And this is how we can fake lighting by actually making the center a little brighter. We'll use this later when we bring in sprites. And another texture to signify the end of the level. It can look like anything you want. And this is going to be the same routine as bringing the image into GIMP to export as a .ppm ASCII, and then open that in Notepad, add a comma to the end of each line, replace the first four lines with our array name, in this case all textures, comma at the end of the array, and include that file in our main code, and let's go ahead and remove these old textures that we made ourselves. We don't need those anymore. Now the main code knows that array name, and we can add it here. And we can skip through each texture in that vertical image we created by multiplying the map value times 32 times 32 times 3, which makes up the number of pixels in each individual texture. And it's working correctly, we can now see multiple textures. Now we just need to get the floor and ceilings working. This map value pixel is fine, but we need to multiply it by 3, since our array has RGB values. We don't need shade anymore, or this line offset from the previous wall code. And here we already calculated the map value, but we multiply by 3 to make sure that we jump through the RGB. And ceilings are really just the floor, but inverted, so we subtract our Y value from our line height. And I want to darken the floors just a little bit to add some variation. And again, one of my favorite things about a Raycaster is how easy it is to update these three arrays to change the level the way you want. I don't know about you, but it feels a little cramped inside these walls, so let's break through that ceiling and actually add a sky in the background. I'm going to the Pixels website and selecting the first cloud image I find. I need to scale it down to 120 by 80 pixels. Now this image currently doesn't tile, but I can offset the image to see that seam and we can remove it so it almost looks like an infinite scrolling sky. And same procedure, export it as a PPM ASCII, bring it into Notepad, make it an array, and then include it in our main code. And you can jump back to this time code if you want to see it in more detail and slower. So we don't start from nowhere, let's copy the code of how we drew the pixels for the wall, so we can reuse it in our sky function, which is a double for loop. We now know these are integer values and it's just going to be this one image. It now recognizes my sky array, and we can throw out the shade and the line offset. And our raycaster is only casting 60 rays, though this is 120, so let's make our pixel size half. And just so I can see it, I'm going to temporarily draw the sky in front of everything. Well hey, it works, but when I turn it doesn't scroll. So to do that, let's use our player's angle, but subtract this x value. This can cause a negative number, so if it is negative, let's add 120 back. And no matter what the value is, we only want 0 to 120, so we can use the modular percent sign. And this x offset is now our new x value. And we never see below the horizon, so we really only need the top 40 pixels. It's technically working, it just seems a little slow to rotate. So let's see what it looks like if we double our player's angle. Okay, that seems a lot better. But obviously this guy needs to be drawn first and behind everything. And let's only draw the ceiling if it's a value above zero, so we can see the sky if there is no ceiling. And these were the previous flat colors that we can comment out. And this just feels better, it opens it up and adds a whole other dimension to our Raycaster. We're really getting somewhere now. Our game looks a little extra pixelated because we're not actually drawing that many rays. We're only drawing 60 vertical lines, so what happens if we double that to 120? Our field of view is now doubled, because we're actually moving each ray back one unit, so let's fix that by moving each ray back only half a unit. And look at how dense those rays are now. That's a lot more vertical lines, but now our image is stretched. And I think we're done looking at that top-down view. From here on out, let's focus on our game view. 
We were shifting our walls, floor, and ceiling over by an offset. But let's remove that so it's actually drawn at the beginning of our window. And our sky can now be the correct scale so we can draw the full 8 pixels. We don't need the top-down view rays anymore. And let's update the main window's resolution to 960 by 640. We update this in the resize function, the main function, and the projection in the initialize function. So those three areas. And I want my window to always appear in the center of the screen. I can use OpenGL to read the screen resolution. Half the screen's width and height will place the corner of the screen in the middle of the frame, and then if I subtract half the window's width and height, it'll position the screen right in the center. And the window opens exactly in the center of the screen, but now you can see that our walls aren't exactly the correct height. Let's ignore the floor and ceilings and just focus on the walls for right now. We doubled our window's resolution, so let's double our initial line height. All the 320s are now 640, and our line offset is now half of that at 320. Our walls are now in the center of the screen in the correct scale. So let's bring back the floor and ceilings. Same thing, double the 320s to 640. And hey, we got our floor, but you can notice they're sliding around a little bit. I calculated this magic number based on the field of view and the aspect ratio, so since we doubled the walls, let's double this number too. And we know if we get the floors working, the ceiling is just the same thing, but our line height is now doubled. To make this feel more like a video game, we need some full screen images. I made a title screen, a wind screen, and a lose screen. And yeah, same thing, save it as a bitmap, then as a dot ppm, then edit into an array, and include in your main code. And since all three image arrays are the exact same size, we can use a pointer that just simply points to another array. So we pass the parameter v, and if v equals 1, have the pointer point to title, v2 points to win, point 3 points to lose. And let's just test it out. We'll pass the number 1, which should show the title screen. Boom, okay. Now test 2 should be the win screen. And finally test 3 is the lose screen. So there we go, one function can easily draw three different images depending on the number we pass. So games have different states that we're in. So let's create a game state and a timer. So I need to rearrange this display function a little bit. And to start off, when the game state is zero, let's just initialize everything. And then at the end, set the game state to one. So we jump out of that if statement. And to avoid a glitch, let's take this out of the initialize function and call it just once in the main function. Okay, back to game states. We've now initialized the game. We jump into game state one, which will be our title screen. Hold for a few seconds. And then jump into game state two, which is our main game loop. And let's use that screen function to draw the title screen. So what we want to happen, the game initializes, we see the title screen for three seconds, and then we jump into our game. And so far, so good. And this works, but let's give it a little style. Let's make that title screen fade up from nothing. And let's move these variables above the screen. So, fade is a variable going from 0 to 1, and if we times our pixel by that, we're going to go from 0 up to where it should be. If fade is less than 1, we increase. If it's over 1, let's cap it at 1. And make sure we clear that variable for each game state. I didn't see any fade, so let me lower the value. And there we go, we have a nice title screen that fades in. A little more dramatic. So how do we win the game? Our level is defined by an 8x8 grid, so let's say if the player's X and Y position are both in that first grid, then let's leave that game state 2, jump into game state 3, where we can draw our win screen. And then after you win, let's just reset the whole game by setting the game state back to 0. and we just loop through this continuously. Ah, but that's right. If we open the door, we need to reset it back to a door. There's a few ways to do this, but I'm just going to take the actual array position and manually set it to 4 each time the game initializes.
And there we go. We have a title screen, we have a game loop, and we have a win screen that once you win, the game just restarts. It's starting to take shape. A lot of you have been asking me and requesting to see sprites in this tutorial. A sprite is just a flat plane within the world that you can have images on. We'll need a few variables per sprite, so let's create a struct to hold all those variables, and then make an array of those structs, so we can have several of these sprites. We need to know what type of sprite this is. Is it static? Is it a key? Is it an enemy? The state of the sprite, is it on or is it off? Which texture map should we draw for the sprite? And what is the position of the sprite? We need to define all these variables in the initialize function. So this sprite one will be my first type one. I'm going to give it a position within our map. And let's create our function to draw these sprites. To draw this in our world, let's first temporarily hold a float value of our sprite position minus our player position. We're going to rotate this sprite around the player, so we need the player's rotation with sine and cosine. This is the rotation matrix that we'll be using to calculate this new position. And that's position in world space, so to convert that to our screen x and y, I'm going to times by a large constant and divide by our z depth, and then reposition that into the center of our screen by taking half the height and half the width. This is actually a 3D projection matrix. And then let's actually draw that point. And the height of 20 will actually put it on our floor. And that is our sprite location. It's being projected on the screen as if it's in 3D space. But you'll notice it's always being drawn last, which means it's always going to be on top of the walls. There's a really creative way to fix this. Our game is drawing the walls with 120 vertical lines. Let's save out the Z depth for each one of those. And we can compare. Only draw this dot if it's on screen, and if this dot's Z depth is closer than the wall. If it's farther than the wall, then it should be behind the wall and we're not going to draw it. And let's just jump right into the game by setting the game state to 2. And you can see now the dot looks like it's behind the walls. It's tricking us into thinking that it's in 3D space, but really we're just choosing to draw it or not draw it, depending on the depth. Let's advance from drawing a dot to drawing a line. We'll define our scale to be 32. So from the center point we draw half to the left and the other half to the right, that should be the full 32 pixels. And I'll just make some corrections here. And there's our 32 pixel line, but it doesn't scale based on distance. So let's times 32 by a constant and divide by our z depth, which we left as variable b, before converting to screen coordinates. And now you can see it's scaling according to that z depth. The larger number, the smaller our line. We first drew a dot, then we drew a line. Now let's draw the square. And that's just like magic. We have a square drawn in the scene that scales on distance and is obstructed when behind walls. But let's have even more fun with this sprite. Let's say if our player's x and y position is within a range of the center of the sprite, let's turn that sprite off. In other words, like you're picking it up, like it's a key. And we haven't used that sprite state yet, so let's add it to our if statements. We only draw this line if the sprite is on and within the screen and closer than the wall's depth. And right here is where we say, if we're in front of the door and we press E, open the door. But let's have one more check. This first sprite is our key, so only open the door if that state is zero. I see a little update here, but then it should work. We can't open the door unless we're in range of the key, which turns off the key, which means we can now open the door. Well, I want more. That's just one sprite, so let's now make all four. That first one was a key, let's make a couple lights, and an enemy. Updating their types, and their maps, and their position. And we can create a simple for loop to cycle through each of the structs in the array. One function to draw all four sprites. And I noticed we could have a problem if the sprite is too small or too big. So let's set our limits here. We now have a key, two sprites on the ceiling, and an enemy. All running at a smooth frame rate. I created three textures, 32 by 32 pixels, but some of the pixels I don't want to draw, so an old school technique is to use a certain shade of purple. It's red 255, green 0, blue 255. So I can check those RGB values with an if statement and decide whether to draw it or not. This was very common in the early 90s games. And same procedure to save it out and include it in this main code. Alright, and finally to add texture to the sprites. We need four variables. 
the texture's X and Y, and the X and Y step value. So just like the vertical wall line, we're going to be stepping through the textures. I'm going to set up the draw routine with already previous code that we have, and just draw the simple pixels using our new sprite texture and variables. So during the Y for loop, we're going to increase the Y position by our step value. And we have to reset this variable back to zero within the X for loop. And what is this step value? It's going to be the height of the texture, 32, divided by the scale. And same for the X step, because we have a square texture. And we've got it, but it's upside down, which we can fix. So instead of our Y going from zero to 32, Let's initialize it at 32 and subtract our step value. And we don't want it going to zero, so let's put a limit. It's the right side, but now we have a problem on the bottom line. I think it's a rounding issue, so let's just knock back 32 to be 31. And that seemed to fix it, but now we have a rounding issue on the X. So let's fix that too. And now we've got it. Let's multiply our map value by 32 by 32 by 3. But that's right, we don't want to see that purple. So we can choose not to draw that purple with a simple if statement. And that looks a lot better. Now let's add another game event. Usually if our player comes in contact with the enemy, it can kill the player. And we can do that by checking if the player's position is close enough to the enemy, set our game state to zero to restart the game. And we should move the variables to the top so all the functions can see it. So if we're in range of the enemy, we're dead, and the game restarts. But normally, enemies don't just stand there, they try to follow you. So let's do that, but start simple. Let's first just say, if the player is to the left of the enemy, make the enemy move to the left. And hello there. And now if the player is to the right of the enemy, make the enemy move to the right. He'll follow us to the left and to the right, and we go back and forth, this little dance. No, 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 copyright, copyright, yeah, okay. And we can, and we can copy and update for the Y, and it should do the exact same thing. If the player is above the sprite, move the sprite up. If the player is below the sprite, move the sprite down. And when all four of these are on at the same time, he, at he attacked and killed me. That's a little too fast, so let's slow down his movement. And his position will now be a float value. That's better, and you can't catch me, can't catch me. But we have another problem. He doesn't care about walls at all. He'll, yep, yep, he will kill me no matter what. We want the ghost to actually slide on the walls the same way we do. So I'm going to create three sets of temporary variables to hold. One is the normal sprite x and y position on the grid. One is that enemy sprite position plus 15, just an offset. And another set of variables with that position minus that offset. So before the sprite moves, we're going to check with the offset. It's kind of like walking in the dark with your hands forward. You'll have your hands on offset so your hands will hit the wall first before you do. Compile and run. And you can't catch me, you can't catch me. Slid across that wall, that's good. So now our enemy will follow us and avoid walls. And finally, let's use that last screen we made. So if the enemy hits us, let's jump to game state 4, where we're going to draw the lose screen. Hold for a few seconds, and then restart the game. And remember, this enemy cannot go through walls, so let's put him behind the door, which will make for a nice reveal when the door opens. Man, I love a Raycaster. This can do so much with so few lines of code. This is already pretty much a simple game, with an enemy to avoid and a win and a lose possibility with the game restarting. An Raycaster can actually look pretty good if you increase the resolution, maybe add some more noise, add some shadows, things on the floor, different variations of sprite, cracks in the wall, you name it. I can't thank you enough for watching this. I hope you're inspired to program yourself. I can continue this series or jump onto a 3D game engine, add in the comments what you want to see next. I still program on the Game Boy Advance, I can show you how to program that too. I'll make this code available for download. So again, thank you so much, I hope to see you next time.